As we begin today, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we invite your Holy Spirit to be present, especially as we open the Holy Scriptures. We need to understand what is going to happen in the future. And I believe that you have meat for us in due season today. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So often when we think about the end of time, we think about the time of tribulation or the time of trouble. And we think of the difficult things that we must go through. And that's very important. It's important to understand what to expect so you can prepare your mind and your heart for what will happen when you stand loyally for Jesus Christ against all opposition, against the whole world, so to speak. And we must recognize that our experience with Christ must be invincible and strong and powerful so that nothing can shake us from the truth as it is in Jesus. But there is another side to the same period of time that we read about in Scripture. And I would like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles today to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Because these verses tell us the other side of the story. You know, in every situation there's, as it were, two sides to the coin. And while we have to think about the difficulties and the trials that we have, there is yet a time, there is yet an experience that God's people will have that is so compelling, so blazing in all of its glory that we must not overlook it. In fact, we can look forward to it because it is God's way of revealing Himself to a rebellious world. So Isaiah chapter 60, beginning with verse 1, we read the following. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. This is a very important verse, and it's one that is rather familiar to many of us, because it is a verse that we often quote, but most of the time we never hear about what this actually means it's as if there's a blank and it's not broken down to help us understand it I would like to do that for us today arise shine the Bible says for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee what is the glory of the Lord the glory of the Lord is his character where do you read that from You get that from Exodus chapter 33 and 34 when Moses asks to see God's glory. God says, okay, I will hide you in the cleft of the rock and I will pass by and you'll be allowed to see my back parts when I withdraw my hand perhaps just a little bit. God said, no man can see my face and live, but I'll let you see my back parts. And so when God passed by, he proclaimed the character and the characteristics of of his glory which were love uh, loving kindness and and uh, forgiveness and mercy and so on these wonderful characteristics of God I think it's uh, there in those verses that Moses recognizes this and he bows his face to the earth for in great reverence we must contemplate the glory of God the character of God But notice that this verse says that the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. In other words, you become a representation of God's character. Well, how does that happen? That happens when God places His character through the Holy Spirit on His people. Now, that doesn't take... It's not something that just is instantaneous. In fact, the Bible says, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee what does it mean to rise is it like turning on a switch and the light comes on or is it like the sun rising in the east in the morning each day 
It's rising. It's gradual process. The character of God cannot be brought into your life instantaneously. It has to be developed over a long period of time. We must recognize that God has to change our lives from within and it does not happen instantaneously. Therefore, we must begin now. Now is the time to begin to model your life after the character of Jesus Christ. If you want to have the Holy Spirit in latter rain power, you must have Jesus' character molded in your own character so that every reaction is exactly what Christ would do. Every circumstance that comes, we must respond to it in the way Jesus would respond. That's very, very important in the last days, especially when God's people will be under pressure of persecution. Arise and shine, for thy light is come. The light is in opposition to darkness. What happens to darkness when there's light? The darkness goes away. You no longer have darkness when you turn on the light switch, so to speak. Or when the sun rises, the darkness flees. Eventually the clouds, uh, the uh, stars disappear. Uh, and the last star, that bright star there in the morning, it finally disappears in the brightness of the sun. In other words, all the things that are involved in darkness when God's character rises upon you must be left off. As the sun rises in the earth and bathes the earth in its brightness, then the darkness dissipates and disappears. The same must happen in your character and in my character. As Christ puts His love, His kindness, His his graciousness, His mercy into my life, then all those evil things begin to fall away. And I never engage them again. This is what the victory of Jesus Christ is. If you want to have victory over the devil and all of the things that he has caused you to do in the past that were in conflict with Christ, that were sin, these things pass away. Because now you are in Christ. Christ's character is in you. And as the glory of the Lord rises upon you, it makes you shine. Your countenance shines with peace and happiness and joy. These are very, very important characteristics for the Christian who is going to go through the last days. We cannot succeed. We cannot pass through the last time without a clear experience with Jesus Christ that overcomes every sin, every temptation to, to express temper and anger, every temptation to do something that is sinful. But when this happens, something else also develops. And we read about this in verse 2. The Bible says in verse 2 of chapter, Isaiah chapter 60 that behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Are we living in a time of gross darkness? Of course we are. Everywhere you turn we see the works of darkness. You see them in, on the news. You see them in terms of war and rumors of war. You see them in terms of, of um, crime and murder and, and uh, ISIS and all the various manifestations of evil. And the Bible tells us that in the last days it will be as it was in the days of Noah where the imaginations of the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. That darkness is gross. Even people paint their fingernails with darkness. Have you noticed? And they wear tattoos that are of darkness. And they do, they dress in ways that reflect the darkness, you know, and, and they try to <laughs> they try to have light. You know, they try to paint their hair with pink color or bright color, you know. And, uh, and so they try to have some light in the midst of all this darkness. They think that this helps them. 
But friends, they have no idea what true light is all about. So they are in gross darkness, and the people sense hopelessness. You know, hopelessness is very dark. We operate a health retreat. Our ministry, Keep the Faith, operates a health retreat in Australia. And a lot of the people that come to our health retreat are in darkness. Not only do they not have any Christian background or any experience in the things of God, but they are also in depression. I'd say 90% of our guests have some level of clinical depression. And that is dark. Because they don't have any hope. They have no place to turn. They have, they have come to the point of desperation. And as a result, they come to our health retreat. Or at least for that, for that and other reasons. They come to our health retreat. And God blesses them so much, it changes them. It dramatically helps them with their darkness and their depression. The Bible says, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. So when this circumstance exists, and we live in the last days now where, where this is a very common thing, it says, The Lord shall arise upon thee. So when God puts His character in us, He puts His glory in us, and He arises, as it were, He puts a shine upon your countenance. And when God shines through your eyes and through your, the smile on your lips, through the joy on your face, He reveals Himself through the glory that is embedded in your heart. It's anchored there and it never comes out. That's when God can trust you with His latter rain. And it says, His glory shall be seen upon thee. These verses are talking about the latter rain. That last movement before Jesus comes again to bring to the people of this world the last testimony of righteousness in Christ. The last testimony of living by God's principles. And the last opportunity to yield themselves to the power of Christ. Oh, friends, we need God's glory in our souls. For we want His glory to be seen upon us, His character to be seen upon, uh, upon us. Now I want you to notice that this is, a, um, this is an interesting point. It says, His glory shall be seen upon thee. Who sees God's glory on you? Those are the people that are in darkness. Those people in gross darkness, they see the light. They say, wow, how do I get that? The Bible tells us that they see the glory that God's people reveal. Now, some people will want to have what you have. Some people want to have the joy that you have in living in Christ. And they will come and they'll ask for it. Others will reject it. Others will oppose it and persecute it. So there's a con conflict that goes on at this time at, at the end. And that conflict is something that you cannot avoid if you're going to truly be in Christ. But God knows how to sustain His people in such conflict. Christ Himself went through similar conflict in His own life. So when the glory of the Lord is seen upon God's people, the people in darkness see that glory. Look at verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to thy light. Oh, wow. In other words, there will be people who will see the light and they will say, I want that light in my life. How do I get that? And they will come to you and they will plead with you to give them that light. Show us what you have. How do you get what you have? I need that in my own life. And it says that kings to the brightness of thy rising. <coughs> kings will come to the brightness of your rising. It will be very bright. In contrast to the darkness, that gross darkness, the brightness is very bright. And that's the amazing thing about the, 
the latter rain. You see, up until the time of the latter rain, there's an increasing darkness. And by the way, why is, why is there darkness? What is it that causes gross darkness to come upon the earth? You see, the, we're told that the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn from the earth. The wicked. You see, as, as the wicked continue on in their rebellion, as they continue on in their opposition to God, God has to withdraw His Spirit from them, and they get more wicked. They become more violent. They become more corrupt. And everybody gets worse and worse and worse. But at the same time as God is withdrawing His Spirit from those people in darkness, He is placing it on His faithful souls in powerful manifestation of His glory. So the brightness is in contrast to the darkness. And those people that are in darkness recognize there's a difference in those people from us. And they come and they ask. And even kings come and ask. Rulers, you know, the kings of the earth who've been committing fornication with the papacy, maybe there'll be a few of them who will come to God's people and say, please tell me, what is it that you have that I don't have? How can I get what you have? Imagine, here in Denmark, do you have a king or a queen? You have a queen, right? Maybe one day you'll have a king. <laughs> Whether it's a king or a queen, it doesn't matter. It may be one day that the Queen of Denmark will come to you and say, would you please be so kind as to show me how I can have the peace and joy. I don't have peace in my heart. I have all the things I need. I have all the money I need. I have all the servants I need. I have all the houses I need. But I don't have the peace that you have. How can I get that? And you will have the privilege of opening the Bible to the Queen of Denmark, perhaps, and showing them how they can have a relationship with Christ. Oh, my friends, this is going to be a powerful time. It is going to be a wonderful experience. It will be an inspiring experience, and it will, it will greatly increase the joy of God's true people. Now, many people will come to those who are in Christ, whose Holy Spirit is poured out upon them in great power. They will give witnessing, they will testify, they will give sermons, they will do Bible studies. Whatever they do, they will have opportunities to share their faith. And God will use them in a mighty way. Notice verse 4. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Oh, friends, if you have children that have left the faith, don't stop praying for them. There is much that God wants to do with them. And if you stop praying for them, He's limited. But if you keep praying for them, the Bible tells us that even the sons who are far off will come and be by your side. Your daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Don't give up. But I want you to notice the first part of the verse. It says... They gather themselves together. Whole groups of people will come and say, Please tell us, how do we get what you have? We have no peace. We have no, no, no happiness. We are bound to such, such addictions and we're self-medicating ourselves all the time. How do we get out of this? Show us the way. And friends, you will have the opportunity to expose the truth of God to them with the compassion of your own heart. You can reveal to them the love and mercy of God who is able to forgive even to the uttermost those that come to God by Him. 
Friends, I think that's a very important thing. Christ is able to save to the uttermost. So even those people in darkness still have hope. As long as the probation hasn't closed, those people still have hope. And no matter what experiences you go through, your passion is to help them find their way. And God says they're going to come to you and they're going to ask you to show them. They come, they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Those that's being spoken of here, they come to thee, that those, those who are of thee, shall we say, these are the ones whom the Holy Spirit has poured out on them the power of Christ because heaven trusts them. That's the only way that you can receive the power of Christ in the latter rain is because heaven trusts you. And all of heaven trusts you. Not just God the Father, not just God the Son, but all of heaven trusts those who have united their lives to Christ and who live by the character of God. Those people who live by the character of God don't break any of the commandments. And God uses them because He trusts them. I want you to think about this a minute. Just turn over to Daniel chapter 10 for a minute. Daniel chapter 10. And we'll look at verse 11. Actually, we'll start with verse 10. It says, And behold, an hand touched me. Daniel was praying, and a hand touched him, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Think about this. So when the hand touches him, he's right away on his knees because he realizes that there's something going to happen. Not only is he on his knees, but he's on the palms of his hands. It's as if he bows low before the majesty of God. And this angel says to Daniel in verse 11, O oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Oh, oh, what does that mean, my friends? For Daniel to be greatly beloved means that all of heaven loved him. But why did all of heaven love him? All of heaven loved Daniel because Daniel had committed his life to Christ. Daniel had determined that he would do nothing that would prevent him from receiving the grace of God and the power of God and the, and the, the, the Spirit of God. And he did receive the Spirit of God. He received it through dreams and visions. He received the prophetic message and he became the prophetic voice in Babylon because he had purposed in his heart that he would do nothing that would defile him in any way. We read about that in Daniel chapter 1. So heaven greatly beloved Daniel because Daniel was trustworthy. And Daniel had shown by his, his character during the first chapter of Daniel and through the second chapter of Daniel and through the third chapter of Daniel and through the sixth chapter of Daniel, Daniel had demonstrated that God could trust him and that all heaven could trust him and that all heaven could pour out the great power of God upon this man. And he became the prophetic voice. And friends, those who are living in the last days, those who have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, they also become the prophetic voice for God to the great darkness of the world. Oh, my friends, what a time that will be. What an experience we must have in order to participate in that time. Light in contrast with darkness. These things create conflict in the world because Satan is unhappy with the way God is using his people. And you can expect that there will be problems. But the Bible is telling us right here that in the midst of all those problems, there will be light and God's people will testify of the power of God and of the love of God and the mercy of God to forgive to the uttermost and empower everyone who receives him to be victorious in Christ 
over the devil. Now notice verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 5. This gets even more interesting. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged. What does this mean? To be enlarged, your heart to be enlarged. That means that you are, you are, your, your happiness grows and it becomes great because your heart is in love. God is doing in your life. Friends, I don't know about you, but I want my heart to be enlarged with joy by seeing souls saved as a result of the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. Your heart shall fear, the Bible says. That doesn't mean that you're afraid of something other than that you respect the power of God so much, you love the power of God so much that you fear to do anything that would break the connection between you and Christ. And that's, that, that, that is the, a, a legitimate type of fear. Otherwise, in Christ, there is no fear. You, you can go through anything and not fear the enemy and not fear the great conglomeration of, of world power and circumstances and globalization that will come against you. No fear. You can walk into the midst of a, a, a den of lions and never have any fear. Oh, friends, God is amazing. Oh. Notice it says, Thou shalt fe- Thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. In Bible prophecy, what is the sea? That's people. Multitudes of people. It says the abundance of the sea. In other words, many people will be converted unto thee. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean they're converted to you personally? No. It means that they're converted to the character of God that resides in you. It is Christ to whom they are converted but they are converted to thee because you're united with Christ and you are the only human example of the power of God that they can see. Therefore, they're converted to thee. You see? So in other words, the sea, the abundance of the sea shall be converted to thee. Thousands will come in to the message as thousands leave. People who who have been part of the faith for many years, perhaps all their lives, they will turn and abandon the faith. They will leave it behind, turn their backs on it, and become the worst enemies of God's true people. But at the same time, thousands from out there in darkness will come in. You see, people leave because they aren't uniting with Christ. And so under the pressure of the last days, of the time of trouble, they will abandon their position and join the ranks of the enemy, we are told. But at the same time, those people who, on whom the Holy Spirit has been poured out, they become the central focus of everyone in the world. And they will see them and they will come to them and thousands of them, the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto them and there will be a mighty harvest ready for the coming of Christ. It's it's going to be a powerful and amazing time, isn't it? Now notice the last phrase. I don't know what your translation says, But mine says, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. And in my margin, it reads the wealth of the Gentiles. Does yours have to say riches or wealth? What what does it say? Hmm? Treasure, okay. So the wealth, the treasure, the, the, the riches of the Gentiles shall come to thee. Now just think about this for a minute. Put yourself 
in these verses as if it's happening today. All right? And see what, what we can learn. So this says that, that there will be um, the abundance of the sea will be converted unto thee. People will come and they'll say, please show me what I can do to be saved and how I can have the peace and happiness that is on your face. And then you open the Bible and you show them the way of salvation. And when you do, they accept it. They yield their lives to Christ and they become one with him and God then uses them. And they come to you and they say, I have... I don't know what to do. I have more money than I know what to do with. <laughs> Can you use some in the cause of Christ? Friends, while we struggle for money now, there will be no struggle then. The Bible tells us that before the close of probation, before wealth becomes worthless, there will be those who come with enormous wealth and they will bring it to God's people and they will say, please use this in the cause of God. How much money do you need? Huh? How much money do you need? 10 million kroner? Maybe that's too faithless. How about 100 million kroner? Or a billion kroner? Or maybe, maybe even more. I don't know. I don't know what God's going to do, but I can tell you this. He will not pour out money on those he cannot trust. He will only pour out that kind of wealth on people that are totally committed to Christ and who have no reservations about anything in their lives for Jesus. They aren't going to spend that money on fancy cars or fancy houses for themselves. Mm -mm. They aren't going to use that money in indulgence, in self-indulgence. Oh, no. They will only use those funds to advance the cause of God. They'll live humbly in whatever place God has placed them. They will not justify buying uh, Things that only gratify their indulgence. But God promises through these verses that the wealth of the Gentiles will come to God's people. <laughs> Imagine. But the Bible even gets more specific, actually, in verse 7. Uh, sorry, verse 6. The Bible says in verse 6 that the multitude of camels shall cover thee. Oh. Oh. And the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. What is camels and dromedaries? This was the ancient system of transportation. They're going to bring, notice what it says they're going to bring. They bring gold and incense. So these the, the, the transportation system will be used to bring gold and incense. Now, maybe in a digital world, there, there'll be some version of that that we don't quite understand. I don't know. But whatever the case, they're going to bring enormous wealth, and they're going to use the transportation system to do it. Maybe they're going to say to you, get on an airplane, come see me. I have something I want to give you. Oh, friends, what a time that's going to be. And so when you get there, they, they offer you so much money that you will even have a hard time knowing what to do with it. You know what you're supposed to do. You know the purpose of it. But exactly how it's going to be fulfilled, you don't really know. They're just going to shower it on you. And they'll say, here, take it. Use it. Do whatever you have to do. Let everybody know how they can find the joy and the peace that I now have because of your testimony. How about that? The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. Ooh. 
The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 37 that the Midianites were the Ishmaelites. Exactly how that fits in with Abraham's wife Keturah and her son Midian, I don't know exactly. Perhaps that needs some study. But we're told that the dromedaries of Midian, friends, the Ishmaelites are the descendants of Ishmael. Who are they today? Those are the Muslims. It's the Muslims. Some of these Muslims will come to us and they shall bring gold and incense and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. <sighs> Wealthy Muslims. These are the businessmen of the world. These are the merchants of the earth, the Bible calls them. These were merchants going down to Egypt that, uh, that, that Joseph's brothers sold him to. You see, the merchants of the earth are described as the Ishmaelites. Now, there are other merchants as well. But the Bible gave them ability to conduct business. Or God gave them the ability to conduct business. The Bible tells us about this. They are the merchants of the earth. And these merchants, when they understand the love of God, even for Muslims, they will yield their lives to Christ and then they will be able to break free of all of that wealth that they've been hoarding for so long. And other super rich, perhaps, and we have many of them today who hide their wealth in shell companies here and there and they try to hoard their wealth and they keep trying to get more. Some of them who find Christ will break it free and give it to God's people in the last days so that they may use it to reach other souls. Oh. That's what these verses are saying. And they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Their whole lives have been changed. And in the last minute, they make this deep commitment to Christ. Many of them suffer for it, but it'll be too late because they've already given all their money away. So nobody could take it back. Some of them will die. There will be martyrs. There will be those who lose their lives because they have found Christ. And because they are Christ's, they are treated as if it were Christ. You know, they hated Christ. And they crucified him. And so some of these people will suffer. But friends, whenever there is suffering for Christ's sake, God never wastes it. He never misses an opportunity to make it very clear why they are suffering. There's always people watching. And there's always seed that is sown that later springs forth to life. And in those dynamic and compelling times, the blazing glory will give them very quick opportunity to rise and shine along with those who stand for righteousness. What a change is going to take place. It's amazing. Verse 7. All the flocks of Keter shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar. Oh, my. In other words, God says that these people who yield themselves to minister to the Lord and to his people in the last days, these will have acceptance on mine altar. I will accept them. I will, I will save them. They shall be mine, God says, when the Holy Spirit moves upon them through your testimony and your witness. They shall come up, upon, uh, come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. What is the house of God's glory? 
Well, we could say that is the house of God's character. And what is the house of God's character? That's the tabernacle. The, the tabernacle services of which the tent in the wilderness was an example or a, a type, it represents the glory of God or the character of God, the character of God to forgive, the character of God to empower, to overcome, and the character of God to cleanse from all unrighteousness. This is God's character. And the Sabbath is especially a part of this glory. These people will become Sabbath keepers. These people will accept the seventh day Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. And they will live by that and they will glorify the house of my glory. God will, God will give special light concerning the sanctuary. He will give special light concerning the services and the ministry of the sanctuary in the last days so that your voice will give them what they need to understand the character of God. And God will glorify His character in the sanctuary, especially the sanctuary in heaven. That's what, we're, that's what our message is all about in the last days, is the most holy place ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. So as you explain this to people and they realize that it's a fantastic concept and it has such power that it will draw them and they will not only support God's cause, God says they will keep his Sabbath and they will show forth the praises of the Lord and they will glorify, he will glorify the house of his glory. Oh. Friends, this is incredible when you think about Isaiah chapter 60 and what it means to us as God's people. They come, the Bible says, they come because they are in darkness and they see the light. So my friends, arise and shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Take on God's character now, so that when that time eventuates and His Holy Spirit can be poured out in great power, you will be a recipient of that great glory. Wow, I want that, don't you? Let us ask God to transform our lives and make us everything that he wants us to be. Would you kneel with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for Isaiah chapter 60. It gives us such a refreshing sense of purpose in the last days that we may have overlooked. Especially in the midst of our thinking and and, and contemplations on the troublous times that are before us and the fulfillments of prophecy. All these things are important, Father. But, Father, we must not forget that you have called us to be your witnesses, even in the midst of this terrible time that lies ahead, and that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in great power. But, Father in heaven, we must first have your character. Your attributes must be anchored into our own hearts so that nothing will separate us from the power of God and from the love of God and from, from His, His law so that all of heaven can trust us, trust us with the power of the Holy Spirit in mighty, in mighty power. So, Father in heaven, work that work of transformation in our lives. Make us what we can become through the power of Jesus, we pray. In his name, I ask. Amen. <laughs>